In my previous video, which was about axial flux electric motors, I mentioned how uh, not every part of a winding inside an electric motor contributes to making torque, and so there is basically active parts of the winding and also inactive parts of the winding. And in the comments, some of you asked questions about that or even straight up disagreed with that. So I'd like to address this a little bit better in today's video. So first of all, a quick recap of what I was actually talking about in that video. So I, I realize that if you've seen that video, you've probably already seen this part. Uh, I promise I'll be quick. And, and if you don't have the patience, you know how the controls work. You could just skip ahead. So imagine that we have a, a part of an electric motor. So this is inside an electric motor. And you know here's a permanent magnet. Here's another permanent magnet. You've got a north pole. Uh, in this case facing the camera, and here you've got a south pole uh, facing the camera, and in front of that you've got a, a winding like this, uh, in which the electric current runs uh, clockwise in this case, and at this moment of course, because it reverses polarity as the motor rotates. Now imagine that in this particular motor, uh, the winding is able to move side to side, so it's able to move uh, like this, or maybe the magnets are able to move side to side, doesn't really matter. Now what you can do, uh, as you might know, you can use the so-called right-hand rule uh, to determine the force that gets applied to a wire that carries an electric current uh, in a magnetic field. And if you apply that right-hand rule to this side of the winding, uh, you'll find a force in this direction. And if you apply that same right-hand rule to this side of the winding, you'll also find a force in this direction. So in other words, our winding wants to move this way. Or uh, maybe the magnets want to move that way. Now the thing is, if you apply that right hand rule then to this section of the winding right here at the top, or to these parts down here at the bottom, then you'll find forces that act along this axis which not only is not the direction that our motor is physically able to move in, but also you'll find that they actually cancel each other out and become zero. So in other words, those parts of our winding uh, don't make any useful force, right? They don't contribute to the torque production of the motor, because that would only be the case uh, if they helped pushing in this direction. And so what you could say is that those parts of our winding are inactive. So they add electrical resistance to our winding, because it's, you know, it's copper wire, it has resistance, uh, but they don't generate any useful torque. And so if you're designing an electric motor, ideally you want to minimize the amount of that wire that is present. So you want the ratio between these sides of the coil uh, and these sides of the coil to be as large as possible. You want to minimize this compared to this. But some people disagreed with this, because there's another way that you can look at this. So you could also say, okay, but this winding is just a coil. In this case, it's just a coil with one turn, but it could also have you know, 20 turns or 100 turns or 500 turns, doesn't really matter. Uh, and in that coil is usually also going to be an iron core of some sort, right? Because in electric motor, rarely do you just have a winding with nothing inside of it. It's going to be wrapped around a piece of iron or steel. And in that case, basically that coil is just an electromagnet, right? You just sort of coil around a piece of metal, you turn it on, it's an electromagnet. And it's going to have a north and a south pole of its own. And in this case, what you'll find is that it has a north pole facing towards the whiteboard. So what you have is a north pole facing this north pole of our permanent magnet over here, so it gets pushed away from that, and at the same time, of course, that north pole is going to get attracted by the south pole over here, which also means that our winding wants to move this way. So that is the same result, just explained differently. But the thing is, if you explain it like this, then it doesn't make any sense for there to be parts of that winding that don't contribute to making any torque. Because in that, in that case, it's just one coil, it's just one big electromagnet, produces one big magnetic field through the core. You know, why would there be parts of that coil that don't contribute to that? It doesn't make any sense. So I believe that this is sort of where these people in the comments uh, were, were coming from. 
Okay, so let's take a step back and instead look at a different situation. Let's talk about a generator. Because at the end of the day, a motor or a generator is the same thing, right? A, a motor is just a generator being powered with electricity and a, a generator is just a motor being spun by an external power source of some kind. So if there is parts of the winding in a motor that don't contribute to the torque production, then you would also expect those same parts not to generate any electricity if this is a generator. So let's say that we have uh, this situation over here. So we have a magnetic field right here, and right next to that magnetic field is a square coil like this. Now I realize that this is kind of an unrealistic scenario where you have a magnetic field that suddenly starts. Uh, don't worry about it, that's just to keep the example simple. Uh, you could do the same thing with a similar drawing to this, but you know, I couldn't be bothered because it doesn't make a difference. So you've got a square coil over here. Now let's say the square coil also has an iron core inside of it. So it's wrapped around a piece of iron. Uh, and what's going to happen is that coil is going to move into the magnetic field uh, this way. Okay. Now what that does is it means we're going to have a magnetic flux through this coil. So if you plot the magnetic flux through this coil uh, over time, you get time on the horizontal axis magnetic flux on the vertical axis uh, and so as this coil moves into the magnetic field you're going to see the magnetic flux rising okay that makes sense and then of course when the coil is entirely inside the magnetic field from that point on it's just going to be a flat line it's going to remain the same now there's a formula for the voltage or the induced emf being induced in a coil uh, which says that the induced emf is equal to the number of turns times the rate of change of magnetic flux. So right here what happens is the magnetic flux changes, which means our rate of change is going to be more than zero. In other words, there is going to be a voltage induced in our coil, uh, and that is effectively you know, electricity being generated. So our generator works perfect. Now what you can also see from this is that if the coil has more turns, that also means it's going to generate a higher voltage. Or if the coil moves at a greater speed, uh, it also will generate a higher voltage, because if it moves faster, the magnetic flux will change more quickly, and the more quickly it changes, the higher the induced EMF. Okay. Now what happens if we make this coil twice as big? So let's say we make this coil twice as long. So we're just going to cut it open on this side, and we're just going to make the thing like that. We're just going to make the thing twice as long, uh, what's going to happen? Well, in this case, when the coil moves into the magnetic field, eventually we're going to have two times as much magnetic flux, because the thing is twice as big. But also, because the length of the coil is twice as long, uh, it's going to take twice as much time for that thing uh, to move into the magnetic field, assuming that it still moves at the same speed. So what's going to happen is our flux is just going to continue on, kind of like that, and then it's going to end up there. So what does that mean for our induced EMF, or our induced voltage? Well, it doesn't change, right? Because the slope of this line, the, the, like how quickly it changes, how fast it increases, that's still exactly the same. So we get exactly the same induced voltage as before. So we've used more wire to make this coil bigger, uh, but we haven't actually got more induced EMF. You might be able to see kind of where I'm going with this now. So instead, what if we made the coil bigger in a different direction? So instead of extending it lengthwise, uh, we extend it like this. So we make it wider instead. That's pretty ugly, but I'm not actually left-handed, so I think it's good enough. Anyway, so now we've still got twice as much surface area, so we're also going to get twice as much magnetic flux. But this time, it's not going to take twice as much time to move into the magnetic field because the thing is not longer than it used to be. So now it's actually going to end up here and our magnetic flux is going to rise kind of like that. So now the magnetic flux changes twice as quickly. In other words, we're going to have twice as much induced EMF. So making the coil twice as big in this direction did nothing for us. Making it twice as big in this direction immediately made uh, a difference. 
And so effectively, this is just another way of saying that these parts of the coil that run in the same direction of the, of the movement, they don't make the induced EMF. It's these parts of the coil that run perpendicular to the direction of movement that actually do the thing. And so this is just another way of explaining the same thing, right? And this, this does not involve the Lorentz force or the right-hand rule or like individual segments of a winding. Um, and yet it comes to the same conclusion. It, it has the same outcome. So what I thought would be a good idea is that instead of just showing you things on a whiteboard and talking about the theory, uh, I should have a practical demonstration. And so I built something over here which involves a couple of magnets and, and a few Legos, and hopefully that's going to make things a bit more clear as well. Right, so what we've got over here is a permanent magnet which is glued down onto a piece of wood and a small Lego vehicle that is able to roll uh, on top of it like so. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take another magnet, or actually you know, a pair of stacked magnets, but let's not worry about that. And this is going to represent our coil. And now, of course, I could have made an actual coil around a piece of iron, uh, but then I would need wires and a power supply, and I kind of couldn't be bothered to do that. So I'm just going to use a permanent magnet, but just use your imagination and say that this is a square coil. Now we're going to put this on top of our vehicle like this. And now what we can see is that it takes force to move this vehicle because the magnets are attracting each other. And this force is effectively the torque that our motor is able to produce. Now, of course, in a real motor, you would have alternating polarity magnets uh, down here, and you could switch the polarity of your coil, and then you could make it move on and on continuously. But we don't need that for this demo. Now, what's interesting about this setup is that we can gauge how much force this produces using a rubber band. So if I take this rubber band and I put it around this brick over here and pull on it very, very gently, you can see that it reaches about this stud over here. Now, if I start pulling on this a bit harder so that I reach the maximum force that the magnets are able to provide, it stretches out to about the third stud over here. So that's about one stud uh, worth of stretching. So we're just going to call that one stud of force. I, I don't no idea how many newtons that is, but it's, it's one stud, okay? Now let's imagine that we take a bigger coil instead. So we make the coil twice as big, like this. Uh, so we're going to put that onto our vehicle, like so. And just put it down like this. Now, how much force is that going to produce? Intuitively, you might say that this is going to be twice as strong. But, of course, if you paid attention to the first part of this video, you'll know that this isn't going to make a difference. Because, yes, the coil has gotten bigger, but it's got bigger in, in a lengthwise direction, which doesn't make a difference. So let's just test that out to verify. I'm just going to put the rubber band around here again. And you can see that it still stretches out about the same amount as before. So it really does not make any difference. And I think what makes this counterintuitive is that people like to think of this in terms of, in this case, the force pulling these two magnets together, which will be a lot larger here because we're using a much bigger magnet. But the thing is, the force pulling these two together is not the same thing uh, as the force that is required to move the thing sideways. Now, of course, what we can also do uh, is we can instead rotate the whole setup like this and put the magnet on the vehicle at a 90 degree angle, so uh, like this. So in this scenario, we will have a lot more force being generated because the magnet is now twice as wide as before, which, according to what we just saw earlier on in the video, should actually make a big difference. So let's take our rubber band again, uh, put it around this brick, and start pulling. And you will notice that it now stretches out uh, about twice as far as it did before. So this does make a big difference, because the magnet is now twice as wide as it used to be, and that width uh, is ultimately what matters in producing the torque. So this is why the end turns, if this was a coil, the, these two sides would be the end turns, 
uh, are effectively wire that doesn't contribute to the torque production of the motor uh, and should be minimized, at least um, compared to these sides of the coil. And that kind of brings us to the end of this video. So hopefully my crappy drawings on a whiteboard and my Lego setup over here made things a little bit easier to understand. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, then maybe consider clicking the like button or subscribing to this channel. Uh, and of course, thank you very much for watching.